Alvin Law, welcome to the Storytelling That Sticks for Business and Life podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you join me today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being with me from your cabin on a lake in Canada. Yeah, it's called Crystal Lake, Saskatchewan. And we named our cottage, you gotta love this because my last name is Law, Shangra Law. <laughs> You've always been an amazing wordsmith. It's fascinating. I have a line for people when they say, when did you start speaking? And I say, 1963. And they go, okay, wait, when were you born? 1960. Well, how could you possibly start speaking in 1963? Because my mom empowered me to answer the question that everybody had to her. What happened to your little boy? Well, talk to him. He's not an idiot. Those are the words she used too. And it made me talk and tell who I was, but I learned to communicate. And without arms, I didn't have that masculine strength, but I had fortitude and I had an attitude and I was precocious. And everybody that ever met me would never forget me because I was talking very well from the beginning. And I think words are still one of my favorite things. I didn't plan to be a speaker, Doug, you know that. So I still think words are important. I think we've gotten a little bit touchy about words and the honesty of them, but we'll talk about that as we go along. I'm just, Doug, I gotta tell you, you thanked me for being here. Uh, I'm gonna embarrass you now. In case the audience doesn't know, in the speaking world that I live in, you are a legend. So thank you for having me. <laughs> well, from one legend to another, thank you very much. <laughs> and Alvin just clued you into something that I wanted to mention very early on. This is an audio podcast, but I'm also going to post the video of this. And since you heard Alvin say, because I was born with no arms, you're going to want to watch the video on YouTube of this interview as well, because you cannot get the full, you know, the full power of this without seeing Alvin and how he is able to express and communicate and be funny and emotional and everything with the most compelling visual story that there is, which is this is a guy with no arms. So how do you go through life with no arms? And how do you find your way into the speaking business knowing that you had to communicate from very early on? Because I can only imagine elementary school and middle school and high school and all of these places where you walk into a room full of people and everybody's eyes immediately come over to you with the question, what the hell, man? Yeah. What happened yeah. to you? So tell us a little bit about that, what we sure. call an origin story of how sure. you developed not only your persona, but over time started to find that there's a, a world called the professional speaking world where I can not just communicate one-on-one -on -one or in small groups of people, but I can take these questions that people are asking me and turn them into something that serves a larger audience. So talk about that a little bit. You bet. So what's very interesting is, A, I, when I was born in 1960, without arms, this is of course way before the internet, way before a lot of the public imagery that we have now. So I was out of this world, odd right from the day that I was born. And that's important because I started my life with a negative. It was obvious, nobody was gonna say, look at that beautiful baby without arms. And the consequence of that was, what caused it? Now we didn't know this, I actually didn't factually know this until I was 28 years old. I was what they called a thalidomide baby. And thalidomide was the medication that was given to my birth mother in her first trimester of pregnancy to help her solve the problem of severe nausea and you know what women go through when they often get early pregnancies. She was a, a, a relatively weak, small woman. She didn't know uh, much about what this medication was, but she had a very rare female gynecologist in small town Saskatchewan, Canada. And the female gynecologist was so legendary herself she was one of what they called the qualified investigators, which is how we used to test pharmaceuticals. Hard to believe, huh? There was no labs. There was no tests. There was like, give them to some doctor. You can't make this stuff up, Doug. 
give the doctors the samples, give the samples to the patients, tell the patients, almost like the joke, call me in the morning. You know, it was literally like that. Let me know what you think. Eventually, it was found that this drug thalidomide, which was not intended for pregnant women or morning sickness, was incredible at helping it. So that's how they marketed it in the very early days of pharmaceutical production in the late 1950s, okay? But the point is, I then got a label attached to me. It didn't matter what I did in my life. I was always going to be this thalidomide baby. But what really changed my life, Doug, to get right to the point, I was so odd and there was so little information about my future, my birth family gave me up when I was five days old. So when in my speeches, I literally say at the very early part of my talk, I was homeless when I was less than a week old. And I'm not saying that to shock the audience. I'm saying it because it's the best thing that ever happened to me, Doug. I was homeless. How could you say that? Well, because I didn't go home with my birth family because they were led to believe I would never have any quality of life. You know, this sounds like a, a movie of the week, but it's not. It's real life. So there I am in a little place called Yorkton, Saskatchewan. Look it up. I was in the hospital by myself. I was even quarantined because they weren't sure if what I had was infectious. <laughs> you, can you believe this? But I was put into a foster home with a 55-year-old woman and a 53-year-old man. Their names were Hilda and Jack Law. And they were not looking to keep any of their foster children. They were actually very, very good at looking after troubled teens. Temple teens would stay two, three weeks, usually while they were in the court system. Jack and Hilda Law never kept them. But when I came to live there, the mindset was, yeah, two, three weeks. Well, here I am, 64 years old. My last name is Law, and I've always had them as my only family. There was no way I was going to fail. There was no way I was going to be dependent. There was no way that I was going to have to live, sorry to say this, in my parents' basement because I was destined for great things. They really believed that because they saw how able I was to overcome having no arms. I used my feet. And again, here they are. You can't see this on the audio. But, you know, Doug, you talked about expression. You've seen me. I even talk with my feet. Wow. So powerful and so um, insightful to know that we have a choice about how to write our own story. And, and this is something that I saw on your website, uh, a little caption that says, write your own story. And we all have had a choice in our life, and especially those of us who become speakers, to look closely at our life, at our upbringing, at all of our joys and sorrows, our traumas and obstacles, and look back at what are the lessons that I can take from this life that I've lived that I can apply to a more general audience, that I can share with other people to help them because people are gonna look at you and immediately are intrigued and have a lot of questions. You, however, and I as professional speakers and as storytellers listening to this podcast have to ask ourselves the question, yeah, but what story do I wanna tell that teaches what point? And how do I share with them how I have written or rewritten the story of my life? So let's move forward to you stepping into professional speaking and becoming a storyteller and becoming a performer because you are a brilliant performer. You've become a stand-up comedian as well. <laughs> and you use self-deprecating humor brilliantly because when someone would look at you and see you with no arms, the first question that they might have in their mind is, oh, poor Alan. Poor right. Alan is like, that is so sad. And you absolutely flip that around with the way that you come across on stage. So talk to me about how you evolved into professional speaking. Where did you start? Uh, I will start by saying I had to follow a career path that made sense. So speaking was not the career path. However, and this is absolutely the truth, I wanted to be a rock star. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to play music for the rest of my life. And I'm not getting away from the speaker story, but this is an integral part of how that performer was born in me. Again, I was precocious, so I was always wanting to get attention. Apparently, when I was three years old, the same time that I was telling people how I became this way, 
I love nothing more than to go to the Legion Hall for wedding dances. And when the band stopped playing, I would get up on stage and sing You Are My Sunshine because I love to sing You Are My Sunshine. And of course, people thought, oh, look at that beautiful little, okay, wait, he's not beautiful. Look at the, boy, there's something wrong here. That little boy is loving life and he's got no arms. That's messed up. Well, it was messed up because that's not what people expected to see. That was how I always thought. I wanted to tell people, not my story, Doug, per se, but to say, look, I'm fine. Look past what's wrong with me. And I wanted to be a performer, but I had to get someone to give me that invitation. And literally, the first invitation had nothing to do with playing instruments. I played Snoopy in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, the musical, in seventh grade at our junior high in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. I actually played Snoopy, but the bonus round was I was a tap dancer and I was very good at tap dancing and I had a soprano voice. And if the audience is interested, look up sometime just for fun, the Supper Time song. There's a song that Snoopy sings in the musical. I got to sing that song and they built me a human adult sized doghouse that I was able to go up the back stairs that nobody could see and dance supper time with my tap dance shoes on top of my doghouse in a soprano voice in seventh grade. And here I am, the end of a song, I got the only standing ovation of the entire evening because the audience was just bawled away with how I could entertain. That told me something, that if I want to distract the audience from what's wrong with me, let's let them focus on what I have as a talent. And thank God for that, her name was Myrna McClary. Myrna McClary gave me my first opportunity to be on stage. But the bigger story is her husband, Blaine McClary, a pair of music instructors who moved to Yorkton from the United States way back in the early 1970s. He was the band director. Now, here's a story, Doug, just for your audience. He calls my mom. He's new to town. He calls my mom because I got 96% on a brand new music aptitude test at school. He was giving this test out because he was new to town and he wanted to evaluate kids to invite them to join the school band program, which was not part of the curriculum at the beginning. So when he tells my mom I got 96%, my mom goes, wow, I always knew he loved music, but why are you calling? I'd like to have him be in my band. Well, did you have an instrument in mind? Mom goes, you know, I mean, this is kind of important. He goes, no, 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 you know what? Why don't you just bring him to the school he can go through the music room. He can pick any instrument he wants. With that kind of talent, I think he could be good at anything. Mom goes, you haven't met him, have you? <laughs> uh, no, I'm new to town. Why, is that important? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, Alvin, she said this, Alvin sort of has no arms. And then there was silence. And then guess what he says? You're kidding. <laughs> no, uh, he was born that way. Well, imagine this, a phone call, not a Zoom call, not a video call like we're capturing today. So he's trying to imagine this. And, you know, basically he was just being human. He said, well, ugh, I wish I would have known that. I'm really embarrassed. There's no way he can be in the band. And he politely said goodbye. I never knew that story until six weeks later I walked in the house because that morning he'd called back. He came up with an instrument that I could play. He brainstormed with other teachers in the school at the high school. And the good news was one of the teachers he brainstormed with went to church with us. So he knew I was a singer. He knew I was a dancer. He knew that my parents were very open to any opportunity. He said, let's just figure this out. Let's figure this out, Doug, imagine it. What are you imagining, audience? What instrument did I get to play? Well, I'll tell you, the trombone. And trombone led to jazz, and jazz led to jazz camp. And jazz camp led to a fateful moment where one day I happened to be walking around this facility in Saskatchewan at a, at a camp called Fort San and I walked into this room there was a set of drums sitting there all by themselves and I'd always loved the drums so I didn't see anybody around I walked over to the kit I got in behind grabbed some sticks between my toes and just started to make noise on the drums well the noise was noise so the head drum instructor sadly we just lost him yesterday and I think he lived in Indiana his name was Jack Mouse Jack Mouse walks in because he's the head drum instructor and he sees me play, and instead of saying, stop that, what are you doing, you crazy human being? He walked over and he went, how'd you learn to do that? 
I said, well, actually, I've got a practice pad at home because I'm starting to take drum lessons, but I'm not allowed to touch the kit until I take the rudimentary course on the book that I was given. He said, well, let me show you something. He taught me a way to adapt my drum playing to using my floor tom as my bass drum. In my left stick, I would use the bass drum beat. And since I was only playing jazz, not heavy metal, the bass drum was complimentary, not essential. But in the process of that musical element and being an entertainer, I knew my guidance counselor was right. I couldn't make a living in music. So I went into broadcasting. I went into study broadcasting in college in Canada for two years. My first job was as an FM all night DJ. So I was one of those rock DJs who searched the stories. And I would tell the stories of the song or the band or the lineage. And because of that, people loved me. But here's another funny story, Doug. What is a guy without arms supposed to sound like? Nobody knew I had no arms because I didn't want to talk about it. But I realized in a magical moment, one day I got invited to speak at a junior high school career fair. And it was the International Year of Disabled Persons in 1981. And I got invited to speak about radio. But you could tell the kids were not paying attention. There was about 100 of them, seventh graders, all looking at me funny. I mean, I knew what they were thinking. So I addressed the issue. I said, okay, look, I'm going to do this at the end. I want you to know I'm here to talk about radio. But do you have any questions? Because you look like you have questions. Well, every kid in the audience put up their hand. Kid in the front row stands up. And this is a classic story of mine, Doug. He says, how do you go to the bathroom? I mean, how do you answer it? I said, that's not a broadcasting question. Okay, that's a really good question. Okay, your audience is now thinking about it. I dare your audience. Okay, Doug, ready? I dare your audience to next time you go to the washroom, don't use your hands and see how far you get. <laughs> so that's a very good reason for me asking that because, hey, I make light of this. But this, this life without arms was never easy, ever. But what I had done was I had taken the positive energy approach, and we would have never called it that. But I realized in that moment, after that talk, I went back to my job, and I realized, and this is very philosophical, and this answers your question, finally, I'm thinking to myself, and I'm not religious, okay, I'm not overly religious, I'm very spiritual. I must have been born for a reason, and it could not have possibly been to sit in a radio booth playing music, as fun as that is. It had to be for something more important. So I decided to put the word out that I could do little talks, master ceremonies, luncheon talks. And because people were looking for a theme speaker for the International Year of Disabled Persons, guess who started getting gigs? And then I started realizing I could actually make money on stage, almost 10 times the amount of money I was making as a DJ. So in 1980 or 1990, well, I guess it was 81, technically, I moved into speaking for that year, but technically I didn't start my actual business until 1988. The speaking itself had originated being storytelling about disability for the year. And then it became awareness talks on conferences for the topic. But what I also realized, I was learning about leadership. So I morphed my disability awareness talks into the idea of leadership. And the leadership talk started with kids, with high school students, then college students, then teachers, and then eventually associations and corporations. It's the same story I told 43 years ago, but it has changed over time because I've changed over time and I've grown as a human being. But what's in every talk is my drum. And here's the next instrument, piano. I also decided I wanted to play the piano. So you're right. It's not exactly a speech, Doug. It's a show. It's a it's like a it's like a very difficult thing to describe. But what it is is never negative. And it's not because I don't want to address negativity, but there's enough negativity flying around in the world as we uh, see it all day every day. I want people to not be inspired by me. I want them to be inspired by my story to inspire their lives. Well, isn't that what we use our life and our stories to do? Because we've all had obstacles and challenges. Yours are certainly unique to you. But every speaker has stories about overcoming adversity and learning how to use those stories to teach a life lesson. 
Now I know that you are a perseverance speaker. Your 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 topic now that I see on your website is perseverance is born from possibility. And let's let's fast forward to now the 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 speeches you do now where you use your life story, your drumming, your piano, your self-deprecating humor to talk about perseverance because everything we've heard so far up to this moment speaks of perseverance. I mean, learning to play the trombone, I can only imagine that you must have sat there in that basement for hours trying to figure out how the hell do I do this? How do I hit these notes? Because speaking requires that we practice, that we persevere, that we take a story and we work the story and we work the story and we work the material and we try this and we try that. And we have to be kind of obsessive if we want to be professionals about this to get to the place where we have mastery over that story. So talk about now as a speaker, how do you approach choosing what story to tell for this speech? What story to tell for that speech? Do I leave this one out? Do I develop this one? Have you improved your stories over time? Do you go back and rework them? Is Darlene with you sometimes? She says, you know, Alvin, you really flopped on that story today. That was a mess. What the hell were you doing up there? Well, what's interesting is I never thought about this as a process or process when I was beginning my career. Um, what's really interesting, Doug, is not to evade your question. I had the corner on the Canadian student leadership market from 1985 to around the mid 90s. For some reason, people were not getting involved in Canada in doing student leadership speeches in schools. A lot of Americans were. A lot of the Americans that at the time were doing it, not all of them, but a lot of them were Olympic athletes, people that had climbed Mount Everest people that had done amazing journeys. So they had a very good story to tell kids about, yes, you can do this too. So if you fill in the blank, my code expression back then was there's no such word as can't. So I was always expressing this idea and that's where I would story tell about how I learned to use my feet, how I learned to brush my teeth and wash my face and brush my hair when I had it. And you know, all those stories, I never tell the kids exactly how I learned to do it, just that this is exactly, and it's a visual thing to watch me. And it was all about this idea of my mom again, encouraging me to not need any help at all. So I said to my audiences, consequently, they were very simple stories, Doug. They were not about a very practical application. They were about, you know, yeah. So what was the hardest thing, kids? The hardest thing was having the confidence to know that I was going to fail every single time I tried something because, and I joke now, there wasn't any YouTube videos. You know, you couldn't go, Siri, what do I do? So you had to figure it out. And how do we figure stuff out? By trying. The trouble with a lot of people, with due respect, is they try and they fail and then they give up. But what I did as a speaker was I started to just tell stories that were really very much about the, the, um, the journey of being a teenager and growing up and how hard it is and making jokes about never getting a date because no girl wanted to hold my foot. You know, little stupid stories like that. And that's where that deprecating humor comes in. One of my favorite ones is a true story was I was 14 years old. And I was getting a little bit uncomfortable with me. Well, no, not a little bit, a lot. And I'm in a restaurant one day having a hamburger. When you have a hamburger, you got to squish it and then squeeze it between your first and second toe and eat it like this. And when you're done, you got to lick your toes off. Okay, that's a video thing for sure. You got to check out the video. <laughs> gotta watch the imagine video. doing that in front of a bunch of 15, 16, 17 year olds. They're all going, Ugh! I go, I know exactly. That's exactly what would happen. So I got so tired of the, everybody going, Ugh! my dad said, okay, you got two options. Never leave the house or go to restaurants and deal with it, son. People are always going to stare at you. Can you come up with an idea to get back at them without being mean? And I came up with the wave. So I'm in a restaurant, people are looking at me. I wave at them. A great story. 1991, I meet Darlene. I'm a single dad to a then five-year-old who's now going to be 39 next week. And uh, I'm like on my own with a kid. And I meet this beautiful woman. And I had no intention of ever getting married again. My first marriage was a disaster. She was also divorced. She was not interested in getting married again. 
But you know how that chemistry works sometimes, Doug? You should know, you and Deborah. Uh, we clicked. One thing led to another, and we became a couple. I brought her to Albuquerque, New Mexico for our first ever road trip together because she wanted to see what I did business-wise. Turns out she was a very accomplished business person herself, human resources expert, all these things. I was terrible at business. So she said, I got to go see what you do. So in that case, specifically, I was speaking at 12 high schools in Albuquerque in five days. Imagine that. So I go to Albuquerque, I tow Darlene along, go to the first school, first day, three high school talks, each an hour long. I got my beautiful girlfriend in the audience. I'm on a roll. I'm on a high. We go to the bar for a couple of cocktails, and she pulls out a notebook. I said, what's that? She goes, we're going to talk about what you did today. And I'm like, okay, throw the compliments. Tell me how awesome I am. She just ripped me, Doug. She just ripped me apart. She goes, why did you tell that story? That story doesn't make any sense. Why did you waste your time? All that color of that story, nobody cares. It became a thing for us where her tag expression became, Doug, what's your point? And that may seem like a simple little thing, but it changed my speaking. And it made me more aware of how every story I tell has to have a reason for being. And as time has gone by, just like any artist, you just get to be good at it. Because this is a human story. I'm not talking to people about how to increase their sales necessarily. I'm talking about how to increase you so you can increase your sales. And where that comes from is my stories of perseverance, of battling through, of never giving up. They're all cliches. But when a guy on stage is standing there without arms, people are very much not going to go, oh, that's a bunch of crap. There's no way that has anything to do with me. Sure has everything to do with you. In fact, that's the point. It's not about me, Doug. It's about everybody else. Well, our stories have to be selfless. Our approach has to be selfish. Now, this is something that I talk about a lot is I and you have to be very selfish in terms of really looking at our material, looking at our stories and saying, this is my life. These are my stories. I have to be selfish about admitting that this would be good and this other one would not be that good. I have to be very selfish about taking the time to develop my stories with an eye towards the selflessness of serving my audience. So I tell stories about myself. You tell stories about yourself. What other material do we have that we know so intimately and we can have so much fun with and so much emotional honesty with other than our own stories? But what I'm hearing from you also is, Thank goodness for Darlene coming along and saying, okay, honey, you know, what's the point? That was self-indulgent. That wasn't self-help. That was self-indulgent. And that's the difference between being a pro and being an amateur is like amateurs don't know what they're doing. They're just telling stories. I can tell you the absolute truth. I have boxes full of written letters from teenagers thanking me for saving their lives because they were struggling in their teenage life. So many of them were contemplating suicide. So many of them were struggling with weight issues and gender issues. And I get up and I, I don't talk about those things. I talk about living my authentic life. And those kids that are confused about who they are saw the world through a different lens. I ran into a guy in an airport not too long ago. He's watching me eat a submarine sandwich with my foot. So then I had to go to the washroom to wash my feet off and he's following me. And I'm kind of creeped up because he's following me. And he taps me on the shoulder and he goes, hey, sorry, can I interrupt you for a sec? Sure. Is your name Alvin? Yeah. Uh, do you know me? He goes, no, uh, I kind of know you. You don't me. You don't know me. Did you speak at a high school? He gave the name of the high school in Montreal in 1994. Uh, yeah, okay, I did. I've been to Montreal many times. He goes, you play the drums with your feet. I went, yeah. Sir, he said, you changed my life. I am a successful business person today because I was struggling with my identity. My parents had split up. My dad was an alcoholic. I was tempted to get into drugs. And you came to school and told me, just be yourself. Don't be embarrassed by what you appear to be to the world because everyone's going to see ugly if that's all you think about. And this is what he said, these exact words. But when you celebrate beauty from within, then you can accomplish anything in your heart because that's where the root of the motivation comes from. Can I give you a hug? I mean, I'm, I'm hugging a total stranger from how many years ago? This just happened last year. 
Now, I'm not trying to impress you with the story, Doug, but we all need to understand as speakers, we can have a lifelong impact on our audience. Not every member, but enough people in the audience that we need to be authentic ourselves. And we need to drop off that, that ego wall that we're so all of us about. And that's hard because you said it. We're kind of stuck in a bad spot because we have to be a little bit of ego to get up on stage and talk in front of 5,000 people. But you know, when I get in front of 5,000 people, my biggest audience was actually 26,000 people in, uh, and actually I was um, over in Uganda. <laughs> um, I was not scared. I was not egotistical. I was going, this is friggin' cool, right? To get up in front of an audience like that. Oh, this is so cool. That may be ego, but actually that's more just professional joy. Well, that's it's called owning it. It's called yeah. owning your your you're owning your gift. It's the selfish, selfless. One of the things that I've said in other podcasts, and I've said this to speakers groups, and the last time I I said this, I was at the, the Montreal group of the Canadian Speakers Association. I remember this so well. My belief when I get up there is here I am. This is what I know. Let's go. No ego, no brag. No apology, no brag, no apology. Here I am. This is what I know. Let's go, which is very clean. It's like not here I am. I know more than you do. Listen to how brilliant I am. It's like, no, this is what I know as of this moment in my life standing in front of you. Let's go. And that selflessness allows me and allows you to be pure and clean in front of an audience. So I want to just shift into something that I, I see with you in front of an audience. And I want you to just address this a little bit. Because of the way that you have developed your onstage personality, a lot of it has to do with self-deprecating humor. To deflect from the fact that people might feel sorry for you or, or judgment about you or whatever. And so you make a light of a lot of different things. You make fun of it. But there's also the use of that humor to then drop down into the emotional honesty of the lesson. So I want you to talk about that rhythm, that tempo. It's almost musical to be able to be using the funny, telling the story, getting the laughs, and then to just take a moment and drop down. What's very interesting, Doug, and believe it or not, uh, I'm going to, again, go through a little tiny moment of embarrassing you. You had a very profound impact on me getting to know you and hearing your material, because you made me think, and I'm not making this up, Doug, you made me think more theater than podium. That's what I started to realize. I started to look at the stage as my theater. And believe it or not, I thought it out. I listened to you. I read a couple of other books, by I can't even remember who they were, about where you are on stage when you do certain things. But here's the nugget. I came up with my opening five minutes. I never really focused on that ever in my career like I did during COVID. And I came up with this idea. I call it the power of impression. I walk out with my nice clothes on, my nice jacket, my nice pants and my expensive shoes. And I do a little walk around going, this is what a motivational speaker looks like. This is a typical white middle-aged motivational speaker with no hair, little soul patch. And here I am. Am I making a good impression? All right. Let's go to the next level. Then I take off my jacket and I do a pirouette. Say, now look at my body. This is what people see. All of a sudden, I'm into the second impression. And that one's called the disabled person impression. And that creates a negative vibe. So let's go to the third impression. Then I go back to the camera a little further away. I grab my sticks, I grab my snare drum, and I play the heck out of my snare drum for 10 seconds. And then I stop. And then I say, okay, in three minutes, I've made three impressions. Which one is the most important one? Well, none of them. The most important impression is what I'm going to leave behind with you today. And what you leave behind with every interaction you have with your people, with your neighbors, with your community every day. Every one of us is in a position every single day to make an impact on the people around us. That became the beginning of a totally different show that was created by COVID. But what I came up with, I don't have it here because I'm sitting on a stool, I now use on stage my storytelling chair. I never used the storytelling chair. So now I have the theater so perfected, all right, 
that I can walk around with my worn microphone. Can you imagine how funny this is? I get to a speaking engagement. I go, by the way, I can't use a handheld. <laughs> so they give me a mic on my head or on my lapel. I can now walk around. I used to walk around too much because I was a very, very active speaker. With HD cameras and gigantic screens, you can't walk around like that anymore. So I learned that. I learned where the parameters are, where on stage you should stop, how far to the front you should be. I learned where the middle is. I learned where my zone for my music is, my zone for my storytelling. When I'm doing a musical thing, it's over there. When I'm doing my storytelling, it's over there. I'm on a chair, I'm sitting down. People know a story is coming. But here's the key, and this is what I learned about being a professional speaker. Quote, unquote, professional speaker means you do everything you can to be the best professional you can. But theater is so much a part of what I do now. Theater is something where as an actor, you are cast into a role. The story's already been written. But I what I did a bunch of Shakespeare. I also did Snoopy and You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. But I was in a lot of different theater productions where I came into it and realized this is a brilliant piece of writing. All I have to do is show up and do my part because the rhythm, the tempo, the highs, the lows, the fast, the slows, the staging will be set. And every night we get to walk out on stage and it's the exact same play every night. It's the exact same words, the exact same scenes, the exact same sequence and staging, the lighting, the sound effects, the music that comes in, everything, all of the moods. It's the same thing every night. And I brought that into speaking and realized, why am I not replicating my speech almost 95% accurate every time? Because that's what they hired me to do. That's professionalism. And the challenge is when I just watched your video on your website, if I was a buyer, a potential buyer who was looking for a speaker, and I heard certain things on that, that video, and then I hired you, I'd be expecting that you were going to do what I saw. Absolutely. And the, challenge, the challenge is if you don't know what's on your video, if you don't actually remember that, oh, I said these certain things on my video, I better ask the buyer, what did you see on my video that you want me to make sure I say? I actually have clients ask me specifically to tell a very specific story because yes. they loved it so much. Yes. Here's the other thing. You nailed it, Doug. Um, I don't want to be clinical about this. But what a professional also does is ask a client, just this is yesterday, what do you want me to do? Not here's what I'm going to do. What do you want me to do? And, you know, it's funny because, quite frankly, the hardest part about having video is every speech I give is different. Let me, let me give you a very quick example, Doug, about the question you asked that I really didn't answer. All right. Here's a segment story. I'll make this quick. I promise. I uh, very early on in my speech talk about of personal experience, okay? Because I didn't understand how it felt to have no arms when I was very tiny. Now, tell me I the grew. story, tell me the story the way you tell it to an audience. Okay, so here's how I tell it. So when I was confused about my having no arms, I was angry. As a teenager in particular, I wanted to blame somebody, but I couldn't even blame my mother because she wasn't my birth mom. She wasn't anywhere to be found. So I couldn't even get mad at her. Somebody needs to be blamed, and that's a very human thing. So it took me a long time to settle into understanding what this means. It happened on August 23rd, 1985, the day that my son Vance was born. And yes, I'm a dad. Don't try to figure out how I did that. Just go with it, okay? But obviously, I went through the birthing process because I'm a modern dad. I'm in the operating room and I'm watching him come to life and they're holding him up by his heels and he's screaming and he's dripping on the floor. And I'm, I, for some reason, I'm watching the pool, not looking at him and I'm mesmerized and I'm almost in this zone and I hear this voice, Mr. Law, Mr. Law, Mr. Law. And I open my eye. What? Where did you go? I don't know. I was just, I was, I was, I, I don't know. I got lost in the moment. And they said, oh, that happens a lot in here. Uh, what do you want? Mr. Law, this is typically where the fathers cut the umbilical cord. And I said, um, they don't really let me play with scissors. <laughs> so somebody cut the cord. They tied the knot. That's a skill. They put him in a bath, got rid of the goo, brought him over, got me a chair, sat me in the chair, and they put him here. He fit here. 
But the point is, I'm sitting there looking at him, a brand new life. And for the first time in my life, this thought occurred to me. I wonder how my mom and dad must have felt the first time they helped me. I was born without arms. I wonder how that day went. The birth of a child is supposed to be a celebration, not a funeral. And then it occurred to me, my mom was 55 years old the first time she held me, and my father was 53, and I was homeless. How does that for the beginning of a life story? And that's what I do. But it's so powerful about the mood you just set with that story of giving birth to your child and holding the visual of holding that baby with your with your legs and being in that emergency room is you took us way down. You got real honest. The emotional honesty of that moment allows us to then have the release of the humor that comes afterwards because you are masterful at taking me up and down and up and down. You can be so funny, but what I want people to learn from this podcast is we can use our traumas and our obstacles and our challenges, and we can poke fun at ourselves, which gives the audience a moment of release from how heavy our stories can be, because I've, I've got some pretty heavy stories as well. But I'm also able to use the humor in a very strategic way. And that's what I love about you is you can take me way, 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 way down. And you must, when you have what you've got on board, being born with no arms, being homeless, all of that, you've got to be willing to take me there, to draw me in. But I was speaking during the time frames in our culture of North America in particular, where bullying became a big topic, all right? So audiences that asked me to, uh, clients would ask me to come into a school and talk about bullying. I said, don't talk about bullying. Yeah, but we're having an anti-bullying day. Okay, well, you're going to have to change the title of the day then. Why? Because I don't call it an anti-bullying day. I call it an empowering, positive approach day. By learning that bullying is a systematic problem all through society, not just in schools. But I have to tell a story. Fine, I'll tell a story. And this is where, again, I learned how to get really honest and almost uncomfortable with an audience about what it feels like to get made fun of and picked on when you have no arms and you can't even use your hands to defend yourself. Can you imagine what I felt like? Totally defenseless and totally demeaned and my dignity removed. You see, I can bring in the anger and it starts to creep in and to feel like, oh my God, why did I have to be born this way? How come I got this life? That sucks, man. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to respond. My parents wouldn't let me complain because that was our, our home idea. You can't complain. Just suck it up, kid. You can deal with this. So what did I learn to do? I learned to throw rocks at my bullies. See? Because the joy of going to a cottage all summer is you learn how to skip stones. And my legs are really strong. And I have a really accurate aim. I hit a kid right in the forehead once from 40 feet. Shut him up for the rest of the school year. I got detention, but I didn't care. It was worth the hurt. Now, that is really direct. But as a school teenage audience, they're like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Because here's the thing, Doug. The schools that I speak in, I don't know what the other ones are like, 99% of them don't bully. It's like life. Only 1% are the duds. The rest of society, I believe, are really, really good. So we have to not cater to that because we want to be politically correct, but we need to be very frank that everybody has a personal experience. Darlene has a great line, Doug, and I think you'd appreciate this because she's the observer. She loves to sit in the back of an audience because she can watch their body language. I said, well, how are you supposed to see their faces? She goes, I know what they're doing. I love it, she says, when they go from it being about you, Alvin, to being about them. There's a moment in time, there's like a button gets pushed. Their story gets turned around. All of a sudden, I'm holding up a mirror to my audience, and they're reflecting on their own personal experiences. And one other thing about talking about raw emotions on stage, Doug, and you may have heard me say this before in a speech. I want to be very blunt and not disrespectful again. The stage is not a healing couch. We don't take our troubles to the podium to get up there and just vent. That is not what I would call professional. It's accurate. 
but we don't want to bum our audience out just because that's what our story represents. That's why the balance has worked so well in my life. The beauty of what I have learned over the years, and I think you're alluding to that, is we can tell a personal story that is about us. It's about our experience. But the elegance of story is that there's a point at which we say, how about you? And we yeah. flip it to you. It's a story about me until it's a story about you. And so people worry sometimes about, well, why would anybody care about my story? Because your story is not about you. It's about you taking your lesson and turning it over to them and saying, how about you? Have you ever been bullied? Have you ever learned how to turn it around? Have you ever struggled? Have you ever come up against prejudice or bigotry? Have you ever, have you, whatever that is, it's to me, all of my stories culminate with how about you? How does this yep, apply in absolutely. your life? And that's what that's what you're saying Darlene sees in the audience. She sees the body language of people going from, I'm hearing about Alvin, this is Alvin, oh, this is about me. And there is a palpable shift in energy where people come to the realization that wasn't about him, that was about me. And that visceral experience that they have in our stories, even though you're up there and you have no arms, and you're playing the drums with your feet. I can relate to the struggle of trying to figure out how do I pull this off? How do I overcome yeah. this obstacle of mine? My obstacle is different than Alvin's obstacle. My insecurity is different than his insecurity, but these are universal principles. And so what we've been talking about today, and it is so powerful to hear you talking about using your life experience and your extremely traumatic stories, but you don't see them as traumatic. But but for the most of us listening, it's like, that is trauma. That is incredible. Homelessness at five days old, that's trauma. And yet transforming yeah. our obstacles into perseverance, into overcoming obstacles, learning the positivity of what that can be is such an empowering message for our audience today. So I want to just take this moment to thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing this wisdom, sharing your life process and your approach to storytelling and speaking. How can people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about you? It's real simple, Doug. It's just alvinlaw.com. Uh, my book is available only at my website, and it's brand new, uh, alvinlaw.com. And in that, they, you go to that page, you can go to the contact page. You can uh, send an email saying you're interested in hiring me, or you can just send an email to say, I have a question for you. Doug, I don't mind answering people's questions. I don't have to get paid every time I talk to somebody. I have so many people email me, especially after a thing like this, where they want to share something, and then they want to hear what I think. No problem. This is what I do. That's why I said I'm always working. I don't mean that in a negative way, right? It's like being a superstar. You're always on stage. But what I think you must do is reduce all of that hyper star mindset into remembering we all were born. We were all given life. We're only given one. We better make sure we honor it every single day. And I got to tell you, one of the reasons I think I get to do things like this, I think that E, that energy I send out into the world brings so many awesome people into mine. And you're one of them, Doug. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today and for being on the Storytelling That Sticks for Business and Life podcast. It's a pleasure and I'll see you around. And he waves goodbye with his feet. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. If you feel that you learned something valuable today, something that you can use that will make your story stick, stories that make you and your business memorable, marketable, and monetizable, there are three things I'd like you to do. First, click on the follow or subscribe button and leave a review wherever you listen. And second, share this podcast with your friends and coworkers, your email list and on social media. And third, connect with me on LinkedIn. 
And when you're ready to get serious about taking your stories to the next level, or if you have an important speech, presentation, or TED Talk coming up, or if you want some guidance on how to make the transition to becoming a professional speaker, let's schedule your free 30-minute coaching session where we can get to know each other and see if we're a good fit. And as always, I'd love to hear from you with your questions and comments. Let me know that you're out there listening and learning. You can send an email with your questions, comments, and suggestions to Deborah at DougStevenson.com. That's Deborah, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, at DougStevenson.com. Hey, thanks for listening. Until the next episode, I'm Doug Stevenson.